Are you a real estate investor looking to sharpen your skills or a newbie looking to become one? You're in the right place. Welcome to Where Should I Invest? Real Estate Investing in Canada with your host, Sarah Larby. Hey guys, welcome back to Where Should I Invest with Sarah Larby, all about real estate investing in Canada. I am going to play for you part two of two with Luc Boiron on flipping properties in Canada, more specifically in the GTA. So we've got lots of great insights from Luke to cover and our famous lightning round questions. All right, let's resume. Can you talk about how you analyze your numbers? For sure. I know you listen to some other podcasts as well, and, and there's some different strategies that people use for flipping. Some people look at uh, the 65 or 70% rule, which is 65 to 70% of your after repair value and you subtract out the renovation cost. So if a property in Toronto, for example, might be a million dollars when it's fixed up, and that's an average property, not even, but it might be worth a million dollars when it's fixed up. And so you take, let's say we're going to 70% rule, you, you would say, okay, it's worth 700,000 and 100,000 are going to need renovations. So I can pay $600,000 for this property. The thing about that is also, it's very back of the envelope, but also with the price points we're at here, we can't really reach those types of rules. So I don't use those as my guidelines. What I do is I actually calculate out all of the costs. And that's everything from land transfer tax, which is Ontario wide, but also there's a double land transfer tax in Toronto. So you pay Ontario and Toronto. Um, there's the legal fees, your financing costs, your renovation costs, uh, your holding costs, all of those costs. I, I calculate them out in a spreadsheet. And then what I look for is 10% of my purchase price in profit on a straightforward cosmetic flip. So the property that I mentioned in Brampton, the semi I was talking about that I bought on Thanksgiving, that was just over $400,000 of a purchase price. So when I ran my numbers, I was looking to make about $40,000 in profit to split with my partner. On that one, we made about 85, as I said, in part because the market carried it up. But a lot of people in this market, or at least in the spring market of this year, when prices were going crazy, people were looking at, well, six months from now, it's going to be worth $100,000 more. So I can, you know, I don't even need to run my numbers. Or if they do run their numbers, they'll pay a price where they would break even, but it'll be worth $100,000 in six months. So I'll just make $100,000. That's not the way I run my numbers. On the day that I purchased the property, I look at the day that I would be buying this property, what would I be able to sell it for renovated? And that's what I run my numbers off of. So 10% of, if I were to sell it renovated on that day, I would make 10% of the purchase price and profit. That's good. You don't want to be a speculator, unfortunately, because then you're going to be caught in the whirlwind. And uh, if the market does take a turn, it's just going to be a lot harder to get out of it without a few bruises. Absolutely. And a lot of flippers, a lot of people have this impression of flippers as speculators, especially in the Toronto market, because there are so many people who say, oh, yes, I flip houses. I buy a bungalow. I wait two years. And then it's worth $300,000 more and I sell it. Right. That's not flipping. That's speculating. Mm -hmm. And that's not what I want to do because it's not a sustainable business model. I don't have control over the result of that. What I do have control over is when I renovate the property, it's worth more than I paid. That's what I can control. And that's what I try to do. I force the appreciation. I don't rely on the market appreciation. And like you said, you buy under market value and you buy, and that's where you make your money is on the purchase. Yes, yeah, exactly. And I think that's, you know, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of investors don't do it like that. And those people get caught in trouble. Yeah. So what do you think, speaking of the market, what do you think is going to happen to flips and what's happening to your current flips right now, now that the market is kind of slowing down and stuff is sitting on the market for many more days than it used to be it really depends on what when you bought it for and the market has had a bit of a downward trend um, i don't know where the bottom is prices have gone down but sales have dropped dramatically mm -hmm. two of the properties that i sold recently i sold after the the government announcement that led to the decreased prices and they took longer and i got a little less than i would have wanted but i had also bought those earlier enough that they also gone up a lot in value from my forecast so I still did pretty well on both of those. I've also bought a few properties that I'm working on now that I bought close to the peak of the prices. So one of those, for example, is going to be coming up probably, I'll probably be listing it by the end of next week. 
And I don't know how that one's going to go. I'm not, I'm not an advocate of, oh, well, if I can't get the price I want, I'll just hold on to it forever uh, or until I do get the price. I'll sell it for what I can get in the market and I'll move on to the next project. And if I have to take a loss on one property, that's fine because if prices have gone down and people can't sell, it's a great time to buy at a discount. And I have been finding because I have two websites up actually that I use to generate seller leads for people who want to sell their house directly without an agent. Okay. Uh, what are they? One of them is I buy houses, Toronto.ca. Okay. And another one is cashhousebuyer.ca. And I actually have shirts made. I walk around with shirts when I visit sellers or on the job site. I, you know, it says I buy houses, Toronto.ca. So people know what I do. Mm-hmm. And if anyone is looking to sell their house, they can ask me about it. So it's, kind of trying to get the word out there that I'm looking to buy a house. And recently on these seller website, I've had a lot of people who actually have the properties listed with agents and they really need to sell, but they aren't able to. So there's opportunities right now to find those types of people and buy the properties at a discount, at enough of a discount to make up for the fact that the market is on a downward trend. It's not easy because a lot of people see, well, my property was worth a million dollars at the peak. That's what I could have sold it for. Now, let's say prices in my neighborhood are down 10%. Things are selling for 900000 and you want to offer me seven fifty or 800000 or whatever it might be. They still don't want to take that big of a hit, but there are people who are willing to because some people need to get out of the property, and I would need to buy at a larger buffer at a larger discount to make up for the fact that I don't know where prices are going to be when I'm finished renovating the property three, four, five, six months from signing the purchase documents. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great way to even look at it. So you're looking at the market downturn as a opportunity to buy more at bigger discounts. And you're not just saying, oh, well, you know what, I'm going to stop and just wait to see what happens in you know a year or two. But you're searching for those discounted opportunities. And I think for my end, as a buy and hold investor, I'm doing the same thing because the market's just temporarily going to be going down or you know softening. Eventually, it'll get back up. I think it is a great time for long-term hold investors to buy properties because with my business model, I need to buy very, very cheap right now because prices are on a decline. And when I run my numbers, like I was saying, I look to be able to buy and sell on the same day that on the day I buy the unrenovated property, what could I sell the renovated one for? Well, another issue is what if I'm anticipating it might be lower in the future, the sale prices of the renovated property. So that's a, that's a concern. And that's a concern because I might be trying to sell in three, four, five months. If someone is planning on holding a property for five years, those concerns are completely different. If you're buying for the long term for five years, 10 years, 25 years, then now is a great time to jump in because you can buy at a discount from what prices were. And prices might be down, let's say, 10% in some areas. But when someone needs to get out and things aren't selling like they expected and they already bought somewhere else, you now might be buying at a 25% discount because you find Mm -hmm. the person in the right situation. So for a long-term hold investor, I think now would be a great time to be buying. Yeah, that's very well said. Now, are you personally looking uh, anywhere in the GTA to buy your next property? I'm constantly looking to buy properties. Like I said, I I was been looking and I've bought 15 properties in the past year and a half. And that's ever Brampton, Scarborough, Whitby, Oshawa, Barrie, Toronto, different parts of Toronto all over. Two of those are, are longer-term holds of those 15, and I'm, uh, one of which is a cottage that I still haven't started renovations on, but plan on renovating it and renting it out on Airbnb. So I'm looking all over. I'm always willing to buy at the right price. Just my definition of the right price in the current market is much lower than it used to be. And what are your goals? Like, Where do you want to take your business in a year from now or five years from now? So in the short term, I'm kind of at a, a bit of a crossroads in the business. I'm at the point where I've got too many properties going on at once to keep doing exactly what I'm doing. I either need to start hiring and grow a bit more, or I need to scale it back to a level that I can handle because I have, right now I have two flips that I'm renovating. I have two buy and holds that are being renovated, including the cottage that we're just getting permits now. I have three properties closing in the next couple of weeks and a fourth in September. So you know, I've got four properties that I'm closing on the purchase soon and kind of four properties that I'm managing the process of the renovation. And 
I'm the only person in my company really doing all of this. So I'm, at, I'm really at that crossroads. Do I grow more, hire, and is it the right time to do that? Or do I scale back a little bit, maybe do two flips at a time uh, or two properties at a time, manage the renovations of that, and, and, and take it a little bit back? In the long term, like I said, and I think that a lot of people who invest in real estate have this vision of passive income, retiring early. I'm no different. I'd like to take what I can make from flipping, keep building up capital in the flipping business, but when I can spare some, take out the capital that I can spare and use it to buy more rental properties for passive income. And I think you can do that outside of the city of Toronto because I don't think the city of Toronto is the best place for passive income. But I do think within a couple hours driving distance of the city of Toronto, there are plenty of places where you can make excellent return on your money. So when I'm at the point where I'm really ready to buy more volumes of rental properties, I might be looking in areas like Woodstock. I, Woodstock, I think, has great potential. I think it's grown quite a bit and mm-hmm. it is continuing to grow. I also think the strategy that a lot of it, Canadian investors do of converting bungalows to duplexes and renting of both units, I think that's an excellent model. And I am really getting excited by the, the Airbnb model. So I may, I'm looking a little bit more into that, but I think there's good ways to get excellent cash flow out of an Airbnb much better than you could out of a typical rental. And I think you can do it anywhere. You could be renting out an Airbnb in Brantford in one of your properties, probably making significantly more than you are on your current long-term rental. Because you'd be surprised about the people who look at Airbnbs as alternative to hotels because they're visiting family, because they're visiting friends at a school, because they're going to a hospital in the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some people, people are renovating their properties and are in between moves or the house is not finished being built. So there's tons of opportunity. Like you said, that is a great, great opportunity. Now, I don't know, you know what is going to happen with Toronto and Airbnb. And like I think personally for me, if I was to do Airbnb, I probably would not do condos. I'd just be a little bit wary about these condo board rules and all that stuff. By cottages and houses and everything that you can control. Absolutely. Um, I I would definitely suggest that is a great idea. Absolutely. And I think the caveat's important, like you said, some condo boards can can have issues with it. If you have a bad neighbor in a condo who's going to be reporting you to the condo board, it's much easier for the condo board just to try to shut you down than to say no to the neighbor. And like you said, in Toronto, they're proposing some new Airbnb rules. It might be a while before anything is implemented, but the rules they're trying to propose is that you can only Airbnb a property that you live in. So if you own a two-bedroom condo or you're renting a two-bedroom condo, you could Airbnb out one of the bedrooms. Or if you live in a duplex, you could rent out one of the units on Airbnb. But they're trying to get rid of people using whole apartments or whole houses as Airbnb units. Yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff coming down. I don't know if you've heard about Bill 144, but that has passed the first hearing. And basically that is another measure to control landlords. And it basically says that after a tenant moves out, then landlords cannot rent for higher. They have to rent for equal or less for the next 12 months. I really hope that does not pass. I would probably think it will. No. I take all my properties and go to the U.S. Like I would say, that's it. I'm selling and then I'm going to invest in another country. But that is just like one of those stupid, crazy measures that, is being implemented or they're trying to implement, it's not implemented, but they're trying to implement to control landlords even more. It seems that regulations come in waves or in cycles and there are so many coming right now. I'm hoping they're realizing that they don't go too far because they've almost already gone too far. Yeah. Um, because as you know, the, the recent changes, they included all newer buildings to also be subject to rent control. Mm-hmm. But what I guess several investors who are investing shorter term don't realize is that it was only a few years ago, I would say maybe 2010, but you might remember better, when it was uh, when rent control was capped to essentially CPI, it was essentially whatever inflation was, so CPI, and that's the amount mm-hmm. you were allowed to increase every year. But it was only a few years ago that they added the rule that it was CPI up to 2.5%. Right. For that, if inflation was 10% a year, you could raise rent 10% a year. And we haven't had an issue with that because inflation has been low. So I don't think there's been a big issue where, you know, inflation hasn't been 5% and we've been capped by that 2.5%. Mm-hmm. But it will, it could be a problem down the road where you won't even be able to grow as your rent as quickly as many of your expenses grow. 
Yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate because in Ontario, you really don't have many rights and you're going to, you're about to have potentially even less and less, but you know, you were talking about inflation and CPI and the 2% or even, you know, the 1.8% or the 1.5% that we can increase. But if you look at everything else, inflation is really more than that because (laughs) I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but how they calculate inflation is For example, if you have a stake one year, and I'm just throwing this example out, but if you have a stake one year and the next year you want to see how much more that piece of meat or steak has increased, on the description, it will be a for like option. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's the exact same piece of steak. It could be mixed with whatever. It could be a different type of meat or et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think that inflation, in my opinion, this is just me going off my soapbox, I don't think we get this true, true number. And it definitely has not reflected for the change in home prices. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you can raise rent one point, you know, eight percent, and your house, uh, you could sell it for thirty percent more. Uh, it makes a diff- big difference. Or if someone's paying thirty percent more to buy it, it, makes a big difference in in what the rents should be going for. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get on to the last part of our podcast, which is called the lightning round. So I'm going to ask you a series of a few questions and you can give a fairly short answer. You can expand a little bit on it. This is going to allow our listeners to get to know you better. You ready? Sure. Okay. So first question is, what is your favorite real estate investing book? Hmm. I probably have more than one. Uh, I would say one one of the first ones I read that stuck with me would be The Acre System. I mm-hmm. believe it's called the Acre System, Authentic Canadian Real Estate System, one of Don Campbell's books, if I remember correctly. I, I read this probably 15 years ago, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and it's a little bit more straightforward, and it's very in line with the RAIN organization's ideas on essentially what you, Sarah, are doing. You know, buy a property, rent it out, then save up, buy another property, rent it out, refinance the earlier property, and keep going. And I read that at a young enough age that it really, really appealed to me. I'm not saying it's only for young people to read, but it was a a great book to get me excited about real estate and how you can really snowball into owning hundreds of properties one day. And so that, that book was great to to start me off. Not entirely a real estate book, but I really liked the E-Myth Revisited, Mm -hmm. which talks about working on your business rather than in your business. And I've been trying to implement some of those things because I have been working in my business too much almost, but it is that kind of type of thing that that book uh, and that type of idea that keeps me from buying one property a year and doing all the renovations myself, because instead I could be doing 20 properties in a year and hiring other people to do renovations and other parts of the, of the process. Uh, and I should also add in uh, my father and my brother wrote what is probably the best book on commercial real estate investing in Canada aptly named Commercial Real Estate Investing in Canada, a complete reference guide. And it's a 600-page volume on learning about investing in commercial real estate, which may be the way to go because if tenant regulations get too strong, there isn't the same rules around commercial real estate. You can evict very quickly a commercial tenant who hasn't paid and just change their locks within the allotted timeline. So I'll throw that out there. Uh, it is an excellent book. And, read all of it, learned a lot about commercial real estate from that. And people who are considering that should, should look at that book. Amazon chapters in the go. You can find it on definitely Amazon. Uh, that's where I've seen it, but probably elsewhere. Um, what about your favorite podcast? I have to pitch, you know, bigger pockets. I'm on mm-hmm. the forums, uh, as I know you are as well. I'm not, I'm not on forums as much anymore, but uh, I, I've listened to all of their podcasts and many of them twice, especially like I was saying, a lot of the U.S. mindset helped me learn a little bit of how um, the U.S. investors do things. And then it's allowed me to kind of rethink about, well, I can't get a mailing list here from list source, but maybe there's a way I can do it. For example, I might be kicking myself here, but you can find a list of violations, enforcement violations on the city of Toronto's website. So anyone who has a notice regarding long grass or property standards or, well, things like noise complaints are there as well but you can break it down by type of notice issued to the homeowner. So if someone has long grass or a property standards issue, 
it might be a rundown property that you could potentially add to a mailing list and send them a letter offering to buy their house. So there are ways to do it in Canada. And so I like listening to the American one. It's inspiring. And also there are things that I use from that and try to bring into the Canadian context. Some very good insight. Thank you. Uh, What about your favorite pastime? So outside of real estate investing, what do you like to do for fun? (laughs) I don't have much time for fun these days. Um, (laughs) I'm actually uh, doing this call from a property that I'm going to be starting to Airbnb very shortly. So we're just kind of here with uh, my wife and we're just at the last point of tweaking it, getting it, getting it ready to go because we have guests coming any day now. But mostly what I do is spending time with my wife. I look at why am I in real estate? It's that passive income. And that passive income isn't for me to uh, go golfing every day. It's, it's that I want to spend time with my family, with my wife. And so whenever I have spare time, we just relax together, whether that's just watching, you know, reality television or some other stupid television show and just sitting out on the couch or, or going out and doing things together. It's really just spending time with, with my wife and my family. And then uh, on top of that, other things I love to do, we love traveling and where we've got a couple trips book. We're going to Canary Islands in November and we're going to be going to Hawaii in February. And it's a mix of beautiful destinations and we mix it in with looking for flight deals. Uh, I have a flexible schedule. She's a lawyer. So if we give enough notice, she can take the time off. So we look for things far out that are very good flight deals and we book them and I can make my schedule free when I need to. And what's exciting is (laughs) since we're, we're all excited right now about the whole potential of the Airbnb thing, we're considering trying to rent out our our apartment while we're gone on vacation for two weeks. Why not, um, right? <laughs> yeah, it should cover our costs of the uh, the Airbnbs we're potentially going to be staying at in those destinations. So we'll see if we'll, you know, I think what we'll do is we'll price it a little high. And if we are able to rent it at a price that we're happy with, then we'll rent it out while we're gone. <laughs> yeah, that's a great plan. So if you lost all your money, let's just say, and you had to start again, how would you start again? So tough to say, but I think I would hope that if I lose my money, I do so in a way that protects my reputation and protects the partners that I deal with. And I try to think about that because the way a lot of my deals are structured is potentially the deal could lose money without me losing any money. But I don't look at it that way, and I would want to protect my partners to keep their money safe. So if I lost all my money, I would hope that it is in a way where my my investors have all been protected and are, are all very happy to keep dealing with me. So I could lose all of my money, but several of the properties I purchased of the 15, I think four have been under my name. One I never even closed on, but I flipped it. I bought it from someone who agreed to sell it to the end buyer after I finished renovating it. I bought it, didn't need a down payment, didn't need to pay land transfer tax, legal fees, any of that. And just through a contract, bought it, renovated it, only had to pay really minor cost for getting a contract ready, uh, and then renovation costs. And I was able to sell that. So instead of spending $200,000, I was able to do the whole project for $50,000. And that one I made about $100,000 profit on. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of ways with very little money or potentially no money. So of the 15 properties, only four I've had my name on. Several, I haven't had a cent of my own money in. And that's not even me trying not to have money in. It's because of the way I structure a lot of my deals is that other people put in the equity and that is what they put into the project. Since they're not doing any of the work, they're not looking for the deal, they're putting the money into the project. So there are a lot of ways where if you have the knowledge, you can find people who really don't have the time to find a deal, who aren't doing this full time, or maybe just don't have the experience yet, who want to work with you and want to make a share of those returns. So even with no money, I could be doing several of these deals that I'm doing right now and continuing. You know, another option, of course, is I could just, uh, I, I love the idea of being, of the fact that as much as I'm not really a lawyer, I am technically a lawyer. And I love, I love the idea of just being able to take advantage of the fact that people get paid so much more in Canada than they do elsewhere in the world. And there are ways that I could do legal work on the internet from other countries, for example, document review. So I would love to say, oh, if I lost everything and I wanted to take some time, let the market recover or let my credit recover. I could go to rent a villa in Southern Italy for 800 euros a month and do document review online for a Canadian firm for 20 hours a week or or working, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours a week 
uh, at a low cost and kind of save up that pool of capital while giving it time for my credit to recover before getting back into real estate. But I don't really see myself ever leaving real estate fully. If I were to lose everything, I think I could get back into it and learn from my mistakes and do it even better. Great. Now, where can listeners find you and reach out to you if they want to know more? So they can reach me at uh, my email. It's Luke B at blissrealtyinvestors.com. So that's L-U-C-B at bliss, B-L-I-S-S, realtyinvestors.com. Um, so that's my main uh, company website, blissrealtyinvestors.com. And obviously, if they want to see my, my home buying website, so like I mentioned earlier, there's the iBuyHousesToronto.ca and the CashHouseBuyer.ca. Perfect. And any last words of advice or anything else you'd like the listeners to know? I know I wanted to say that I know your show is, is tends to be very market specific and what I do isn't really tied to any particular market. And I think what I learned was I thought you couldn't flip in Canada. I thought prices were too high. I thought transaction costs were too high. I thought banking regulations were, were too strict. I thought nobody would sell in any other way other than with a real estate agent at full market value. I thought it was impossible. But what I realized is it's actually not only is it possible, you can do it well. So I would say challenge your assumptions of your market of what is possible and also realize that you don't necessarily need to leave your market to succeed in real estate investing. You have the choice to go to a different market or you have the choice to invest in real estate in a different way. And there's very passive potentially, you know, you could invest your money with one of the mortgage investment companies and making 10% a year or more on your capital all the way to wholesaling, which is a very small category in Canada, but there are immense amounts of of money to be made. I I know the first wholesale deal I tried to buy from a wholesaler, he made, I think, $46,000 on it. All he he did was he met with the homeowner. Of course, I'm saying all he did, but he advertised to find a homeowner who was willing to sell. He then met with the homeowner, convinced them to sell at a certain price. And then he had a buyer's list and he had signed the contract out to one of those buyers and he made a $46,000 assignment fee without ever closing on the property. I'm getting into wholesaling a little bit as well as I buy a lot of properties and I may not have the capacity to flip all of them. But what I'm trying to say there is that you can tweak your real estate investing strategy for your market and also find things that you can do differently, that you can do better than other people. You don't need to stick to the conventional wisdom. Well, thank you. With that, I mean, that's really well said. And I learned so much about flipping. I am not a flipper, as you know. Uh, You definitely make it very interesting and enticing. And I like how you're looking at it as a dual option with flipping and buy and hold to eventually retire early. I want to thank you for being on Where Should I Invest? And uh, good luck in your future success. Thank you so much for having me. All right, guys, that concludes part two of two of Where Should I Invest? Real Estate Investing in Canada on flipping in the GTA with Luc Boiron. And if you'd like to see more of Luc, feel free to attend his seminars that he hosts monthly. And you can find those on Meetup. That app is great, by the way. And see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to Where Should I Invest with your host, Sarah Larby. Make sure to listen in next time. We'll catch you on the next episode of Where Should I Invest.